Hello and welcome to this special edition of Vantage. We are coming to you live from Tel Aviv, Israel's second biggest city, also its commercial capital. Normally, the city is buzzing around this time, but not today. Today, Tel Aviv has been silenced by sirens and explosions. It is a war zone. Hamas has been striking Israel through the weekend, and Israel has responded with force. They've been bombing Gaza non-stop. The death toll is said to have crossed 1,100, many of them civilians. On the internet, there are many reports about this war, some conflicting, some confusing, and some outright false. As they say, the first casualty of any war is truth. And that is the reason we decided to come to Ground Zero, to see for ourselves where this war is heading. Over the next few days, we will keep you informed about everything that's happening here, the military strategies, the political response, and of course, the rising human cost. In such situations, facts matter the most. But to get there, you must wade through many hurdles. The propaganda, the vested interests, and in this case, rocket strikes. And that is our mission here in Israel, to show you the reality of this war, the uncensored and unadulterated reality. We've got a packed show lined up for you, the latest updates from the front lines, the inside details of how Hamas could have pulled off this sneak attack, and what it means for Israel's famous intelligence setup. Let's get started. I know there's a lot happening right now and you're being flooded by information. So let's try to simplify things. Let's look at 10 questions. 10 questions that explain this war and what happens next. What is happening in Israel as we speak? Question number one, what is the situation on the front line? Israel says the border communities have been retaken. Around 1,000 Hamas terrorists had launched an incursion on Saturday. They held on to localities in Israel's south. The next day, Israel declared war. They called in the military and special forces, and there were grueling gunfights in the south, but now most of the border communities have been liberated. Only a few holdouts still remain. What about the terrorists? They've either been killed or driven out. But the battle is not limited to southern Israel anymore. It is spread across the region. Israel is carrying out air raids on Gaza. More than a thousand Hamas targets have been hit. You can see plumes of black smoke across the Strip, the Gaza Strip. Many civilian buildings were also hit, but Hamas is not backing down. In fact, they're hitting back. Hamas fired more rockets through the day today. Air raid sirens rang across central Israel. People in Jerusalem were seen heading for cover. So this is not a localized incursion anymore. It is much bigger. Question number two, what is the death toll? Last we checked, it was around 1,200. Around 700 dead in Israel, which is their worst toll in decades, and more than 400 people dead in Gaza. And at least 4,000 people are injured on both sides. The United Nations says around 1,23,000 people, 123,000 people in Gaza have been displaced. They've fled their homes. So the human toll is massive. And remember, this is in just three days of fighting. If the war escalates, it could be worse. Which brings us to question number three. What happens next? Well, they're not looking at de-escalation for sure, not yet. Israel has called up around 300,000 reservists. Their defense ministry has announced a siege. Listen to this. We are imposing a complete siege on Gaza. There will be no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything will be closed. We are fighting against human animals and we are acting accordingly. Israel's immediate priority is this freeing the hostages held by Hamas. More than 100 of them are held in Gaza. But after that, what does Israel do? 
There is talk of a land invasion to occupy Gaza, to topple the Hamas. Israel's government has not officially confirmed any of this, but their prime minister did issue a warning. He asked Palestinians to start leaving. He said Gaza would be turned into an island of ruins. So the operation is not over, plus Hamas has lost the element of surprise, which means it is advantage Israel now. They decide where this war goes next. Question number four. Was Iran involved in this attack? Well, officially, Tehran has denied any involvement, but Hamas spokesmen say they did get help from Tehran. The planning began in the month of August, and we will detail the operation later on the show on how Hamas pulled it off. But frankly, it's not surprising. Iran and Hamas have a long history of cooperation. Their support, their weapons, all of it comes from Iran. So the chances of Hamas going solo are very low. Question number five. Will the war spill over? And that is a real risk, the biggest risk right now, in fact. The Hezbollah in Lebanon have joined this fighting. Like Hamas, the Hezbollah is also close to Iran. They're sort of like an Iranian proxy. On Sunday, they began firing at Israeli positions. Hezbollah say their guns and rockets are with Hamas. In other words, they are in full support. So the worry is clear. Hezbollah could open a second front in this war. Which brings us to question number six. What is Israel's most important partner doing? I mean the United States of America. What are they doing? President Biden spoke to Prime Minister Netanyahu on Sunday and he said more military aid is on the way. He has also deployed U.S. military assets to the region. One of them stands out. It's a carrier strike group. The U.S. has deployed the world's largest aircraft carrier to the eastern Mediterranean, the USS Gerald Ford. They're also sending fighter jets to the region both the F-15s and the f 35 So America's message is clear. Let Israel do its job. Do not dare intervene. And this support is key for Israel. It gives them the freedom to carry on without fearing outside attacks, say from Iran or Hezbollah. Question number seven. What does this war mean for Prime Minister Netanyahu? He was called Mr. Security, the man who knew Israel's military and intelligence inside out, yet this happened under him. And it's not a good look for any, any Israeli prime minister. His critics say he was too distracted. Maybe the judicial reforms he pushed or his tricky coalition politics. Either way, Netanyahu dropped the ball. There are 100 hostages in Gaza as we speak. Their families are putting pressure on the prime minister. They want him to negotiate to get them out. But those on the right want him to push on, to punish the Hamas. So he may win this war, but the damage is already done. Question number eight, is this the end of the Arab-Israel normalization process? For now, yes. If not the end, it will be on hold. No Arab nation will touch this issue, at least for a while now. Maybe this was the whole idea behind the attack. Question number nine, what happens to Palestine? Well, this attack has complicated matters for Palestine. Countries are rethinking their support to Palestine. Countries like Germany and Austria. Austria has ended all aid to the Palestinians. Germany says it will review whether aid should be given anymore. What does this show? It shows that countries are losing patience with Palestine, with their divided leadership, their radical tactics. All of it has fewer takers now. And finally, we have question number 10. How does this war impact you? More than 1,000 people dead is enough to move any human being. But beyond that, there are other impacts. It doesn't matter where in the world you live, chances are this war will affect you. Just consider oil prices. War in West Asia always spooks the oil market. Today, oil prices jumped by 5%. Brent crude reached $89 per barrel. And remember, Israel and Palestine do not produce oil. They're not even involved in oil shipments. Yet, this is the impact. So imagine if Iran gets involved or there is fighting in the Gulf, then oil prices would go through the roof. So this is a war that will impact everyone. Like I said, a war impacts everyone and especially those here in Israel. I know there are a lot of questions. We are here to bring you the answers. Our team landed at the Ben Gurion airport this morning. It is Israel's biggest airport. It is located in the capital of Tel Aviv. The airport was full of people, mostly two kinds, journalists and reservists. So what is the situation like? Can you still travel to Israel? Are flights still running? Our next report brings you all the answers. 
When you land at any airport, you see a lot of signs. Signs that lead you to baggage claim. Signs that lead you to immigration. Signs that lead you to the exit. But at Israel's Ben Gurion Airport, we were met with a different kind of sign. A sign leading you to bomb shelters. And as we landed at the airport, we saw multiple signs pointing people towards a bomb shelter. No one's taking chances with their security at this point, given the fact that their country is at war. Soon, we realized why the signs were placed. After minutes at the airport, the sirens went off. It was a sign of rocket fire. People started scrambling. They were rushing to take cover. We followed. We're still at the airport. We were just heading out. Uh, there is the exit gate. And just as we were about to step out, uh, uh, we heard sirens. Uh, and we've uh, uh, looked at, uh, as you can see, uh, the security, uh, the, the exit area is now completely deserted. Uh, the people who left uh, the airport premises have uh, walked back inside. They've rushed back inside after the, uh, the sirens sounded. And we've uh, uh, seen alerts from the IDF, that is the Israeli Defense Forces. And they've said that sirens have been sounded in central Israel. Um, uh, and this has been uh, the situation for the past uh, two to three days, ever since uh, the attacks from Hamas began. Um, and there are reports that the Ben Gurion International Airport may be one of the targets. Israel is no stranger to wars or rocket attacks. Israeli citizens have the Alert app. It gives real-time alerts on when a rocket is fired into Israel. Plus, there are air raids and sirens. Most Israelis are used to them. They get an alert, they hear a siren, and they take shelter. But Saturday's attack wasn't like any other that Israel has seen in decades. And the scenes at the airport were a witness to that. I'm at the Ben Gurion International Airport in Israel. It's Monday morning. You can see a lot of people, a lot of buzz at the airport. But I can tell you that this can be deceptive. It feels like any other day, but it's anything but. This is a country at war. Uh, and when war breaks out, uh, you see a lot of action at airports invariably because there are two sets of people. There are uh, huge crowds trying to leave a war zone. And then there are two sets of people who are trying to pour in, who line up to enter a war zone. These are journalists and soldiers. And the flight that we took this morning was packed with both. We spoke to some of our co-passengers. Uh, the journalists have come from various parts of the world. They're trying to capture uh, the situation in Israel and trying to make sense of uh, the conflict that is escalating by the hour. Uh, the Israeli citizens are basically uh, uh, members of the reservist force. Their country is at war and they're reporting for duty. Major airlines have cancelled flights to Israel. There are warnings of travel disruptions. On the other hand, countries are evacuating nationals. 300 Polish and Hungarian nationals have been evacuated. Thailand and Nepal are considering evacuations as well. Just a few weeks ago, Israel was hoping for a tourism boom. In 2022, the country welcomed 2.7 million tourists. It brought $4 billion back into the economy. This year, it was expecting the numbers to reach 4 billion. But the Hamas attack has derailed any hopes for that. This is now a country at war. It's a reminder that for Israel, security is still a luxury and not a guarantee. This brings us to the question, how did Hamas pull off the impossible? Saturday was the day of the Jewish Shabbat. It's a holy day for Jews. When the attack happened, most of them were at home. They were looking forward to spending the day with their friends and family. But soon their world turned upside down. The attacks began at dawn, approximately 6.30 a.m. local time. A barrage of rockets fell upon Israel. The Iron Dome system jumped into action, but soon it was overwhelmed by the large deluge of rockets. So Israel was distracted by the rockets, but the Hamas had other plans in place. A ground invasion. They gathered near the Gaza border. The Hamas terrorists, the plan was to breach the fence, the one that separates Israel from Gaza, the border fence. They breached it. Now, to put things in context, the Israel-Gaza border is not like any other border. It is heavily fortified. Gaza has seven official crossings. Six of them are controlled by Israel. There's a fence in some parts. In other parts, there's a wall. Plus, there are soldiers. There are security cameras. There are sensors. But on that day, Hamas breached all of this. They killed Israeli soldiers, they breached the fence, 
and soon they were in Israel. Some even took the air route, using paragliders to land straight into Israel. Others tried to breach the country via sea, so it was an attack on all fronts, air, land and sea. And soon Hamas was pouring into various parts of Israel. In a matter of hours, these terrorists were in control of border towns. It's the biggest attack Israel has seen in a generation, the biggest since the 1973 Yom Kippur War. So that's 50 years. Clearly, Israel was caught off guard. But does this make it a sudden attack? It's highly unlikely. Hamas may say it was a surprise invasion, a retaliation against recent Israeli actions, but reports suggest that this was in the planning for months. You see, before this attack, Israel Palestinian tensions were at an all-time high. Palestinians attacked Israelis. There were multiple raids in the West Bank. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Netanyahu was leading the most right-wing government in Israel. And they called for more settlements. So tensions were rising. The stage was set. There were warnings of an all-out war. Warnings that Hamas sounded. Warnings that Israel ignored. But no one expected an attack this complex and coordinated. An attack of this scale would take a lot of planning. And the signs were all there. Multiple reports say there were indications. Hamas gave Israel the impression that they did not want to fight, but they were training in plain sight. Reports say Hamas had built a mock Israeli settlement in Gaza. It is here that they practiced a mock military landing. Basically, they were training themselves on how to storm Israel. There were even videos of maneuvers. So it was all happening in the open, but Israel apparently dismissed it as mere posturing. Of course, there have been offensives in the past too, like in 2021, there was the Gaza war. But none of it has been this brazen. Which brings us to the question, was Hamas acting alone? Well, they themselves say that they received help from Iran. And a new report supports this theory. This is a report from the Wall Street Journal. It says that Tehran and Hamas have been planning this attack for months. The talks apparently started in the month of August. Iran's revolutionary guards then met with Hamas. They trained them on how to breach Israel's borders. And apparently the go-ahead came just last week. The two groups are said to have met in Beirut last month. That's where they finalized the plan. So basically, Hamas is said to have acted only after it got a green light from Iran. And what does Tehran say about this? Well, they have vehemently denied all such reports. They said that they have no role in the attacks. At the same time, they've also supported the actions of Hamas, the attacks that they carried out on Israel. It is a manifestation of resistance and standing up against the fake Zionist regime. The Palestinian people, the Palestinian soldiers, all Palestinian groups and the Islamic Ummah really should be congratulated for this victory. So Iran says it is not involved, but it's a hard sell. Of course, Iran is a part of the picture. This is a country that has supported Hamas for years, both with weapons and with funds. According to some accounts, 70% of Hamas funding comes from Iran. And this includes military equipment and training. So while Tehran may deny involvement, it is definitely not a bystander in this conflict. I'll tell you who was a bystander here. Israeli intelligence. It's shocking, really. You think elite espionage, you think Mossad. They've carried out operations in different countries. They've infiltrated enemy organizations. They've killed Iranian nuclear scientists in Iran. Yet they could not track this. An attack right under their nose. How did that happen? Was it overconfidence, poor intelligence, or something else? Well, overconfidence for certainly one reason, even for the Americans. They'd struck a series of peace deals in West Asia. A number of Arab states had recognized Israel, so they thought, job done. Look at what America's national security advisor said eight days ago. His name is Jack Sullivan. He said, the Middle East is quieter today than in two decades. If that wasn't overconfidence, I wonder what is. But that alone does not cause a disaster like this. Poor intelligence played a role here too. Reports say Hamas pulled off a great deception. They lulled Israel into a false sense of security. I'll explain how. In 2021, Hamas and Israel fought a short war. But since then, there have been no military operations. Hamas was quiet for more than two years. They even talked about economic gains. 
about progress for the people in Gaza and Israel bought it. They provided financial incentives to Gaza, even gave thousands of work permits so people from Gaza could work in Israel and the West Bank. And their salaries were 10 times what they got in Gaza. But behind the scenes, Hamas was busy training soldiers, stocking up weapons and rockets, even building mock Israeli settlements for practice, the ones we just told you about. How did Israel miss all of this? Well, according to some officials, they did not. Apparently, Israel did have information about these weapons. Unfortunately, they could not connect the dots. They failed to realize that it was all meant for one single attack. Other reports say Egypt also warned them. They cautioned Israel about an impending attack. And once again, Israel ignored it. In other words, this attack was preventable. But let's forget intelligence for now. Let's also focus on what, what else could have gone wrong. For starters, the technology. It went wrong for sure. Israel and Gaza are separated by a massive barrier. It is made up with 140,000 tons of iron and steel. The total cost of building this was $1.1 billion. Israel called it the Iron Wall. Around 65 kilometers of this wall is underground, so no tunneling business either. You had hundreds of cameras, sensors and command posts. The idea was to prevent all types of attacks. But look at what happened on Saturday. Hamas bulldozed through the Iron Wall. They literally cut the fencing wire in some places. What happened to the cameras and sensors? Well, only Israel's government can tell us. But you know what? Let's also keep the technology aside for now. Common sense should have stopped this attack. Just look at the events of the past one year. Israel-Arab cooperation has reached new heights. They're building an economic corridor together. Saudi Arabia has been talking about normalization. So Israel's isolation was ending, and it was ending fast. Then you had the West Bank situation. Israel was carrying out more raids and building more settlements. The biggest raid was held in July, the biggest in more than 20 years. Close to 200 Palestinians were killed by Israeli fire in one year. That's the highest in a long, long time. So the ground sentiment was very strong. Plus, there was internal turmoil in Israel. Thousands protested against Prime Minister Netanyahu's judicial reforms. The Prime Minister was under pressure and he was distracted. His relations with the U.S. also suffered. President Biden did not invite him. He did not invite Netanyahu to Washington for nine months. That's the longest time for an Israeli prime minister. Now put all these factors together, rising violence in the West Bank, trouble and protests at home, rapid normalization process, and cooling relations with the US. It was the perfect moment for Israel's enemies to strike. They were distracted and caught napping. Many former Israeli intelligence officials have called out these agencies. A probe is already underway. Officials say it could take years to complete, but the damage has already been done. Israel spends billions of dollars on intelligence. Their spy agency, Mossad, has a budget of $3 billion. Around 7,000 people work for them. So resource was not their problem. Inputs was not their problem. I guess the buck stops with the leadership. Saturday was a nightmare for Israel and for many families the horror is not over. Their loved ones are being held captive in Gaza. Hamas has taken Israeli hostages, both soldiers and civilians. This includes entire families, women, children and the elderly and some of them are foreigners. Israeli Defense Forces say dozens of people have been captured. Most reports put the number at well over 100. In fact, Islamic Jihad alone has, is said to have taken 30 hostages. This is a second Palestinian militant group, Islamic Jihad. Now, it's not clear where these people are being held and in what condition. Some videos are circulating on social media. They're quite disturbing. I'm sure you've seen some of them. And the presence of hostages complicates the Israeli response. Our next report tells you about the hostage crisis in Israel. Terrified Israeli civilians, soldiers, foreigners, some bloodied, many hooded, most of them with their hands tied, all being marched away by Hamas terrorists. It is shocking, but this is the reality of Israel as we speak. 
since the conflict began, Hamas terrorists have captured dozens, including children and women and the elderly. The Israeli government is grappling to define the exact number of people kidnapped. Palestinian Islamic Jihad says it alone has seized 30 hostages. It's both smaller and more brazen than Hamas. Meanwhile, Israeli news outlets speculate that over 100 people have been captured. What has stunned Israel and the world is the multi-pronged attack on Israel. Not the incident itself, but the sheer scale of it. The capture is in line with similar practices by Gaza terrorists like the one in 2006, when Hamas captured Gilad Shalit, a young conscript. He was the only one held hostage at the time. But the incident consumed the Israeli society for years. It became a national obsession. It prompted Israel to heavily bombard the Gaza Strip. Ultimately, over 1,000 Palestinian prisoners were released. This happened in exchange for Shalit's freedom. But now, dozens have been held hostage, a number that until now was unimaginable. Shocking visuals have been flooding the internet, like this one. It's an amateur video that has been geolocated to the Gaza Strip. It shows a barefoot injured woman. Her arms are behind her back. She's being dragged by armed men who brutally bundle her into the back seat of a vehicle. Now, the whereabouts of those held captive, much like her, have become a pressing issue for the Israeli military. They fear that the hostages are spread across several undisclosed locations across Gaza. You see, Gaza may be tiny, but it's heavily populated. It's subjected to constant aerial surveillance by Israel, but the strip remains somewhat opaque. In 2006, Israeli intelligence failed to locate Shalit, and now the same worries are resurfacing. It's a race against time to locate Israeli hostages. This is something that entire families are eagerly awaiting. Shaken relatives have called on the government to bring home the captives. Many are sharing stories of their missing relatives on the radio. But remember, this attack has impacted families across the world. The list of kidnapped foreign nationals is growing. According to reports, 11 Thai nationals, a French citizen, several Americans and Germans and one Britisher may have been captured. Two Mexican nationals, three Brazilians and a Nepali student are among those missing. As cruel as it is, this could be a bargaining chip for Hamas. It may want to exchange Israeli for Palestinian captives. It already seeks the release of all Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. Around 4,500 Palestinians have been detained in Israel. The question is, will Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu free them? Will he agree to the demands of the terrorists? It seems highly unlikely. As difficult as it is, Israeli police is trying to eat the elephant one bite at a time, much like what you see here. The police claim that some hostages were released by Hamas after a gun battle. But even so, the human cost of this conflict continues to soar, and innocents are being kidnapped by terrorists. The question is, what will become of those who are collateral damage in this bloody fight? It's a dilemma that Netanyahu must find a way out of, while knowing that the answer is painfully obvious to those whose loved ones are being held hostage. So there's a war again in West Asia, but where do its countries stand? For Arab nations, the Palestinian cause has been a rallying cry. For long, most of them have argued one thing. Recognizing Israel must come with the creation of a Palestinian state. This has been the red line in West Asia, a line that has now disappeared in the sand, it seems. In 2020, Israel normalized ties with Arab nations, namely Bahrain, Morocco and the UAE. It was called the Abraham Accords. The focus was economy and peace. It was supposed to be a dawn of a new West Asia. But Palestinians were left behind. Then there were reports of an, Iran, of, of an Israel-Saudi peace deal. There was talk of concessions, regional security, even nuclear projects with Saudi Arabia. But the Palestinian cause was on the back burner once again. It's like the Arab nations had switched sides. They chose security and economy over Palestinians, which brings us to the Hamas attack on Saturday. Hamas says it was a retaliatory attack. 
an attack to hit back against Israel's actions in Gaza. But many believe it was bigger than that. It was a ploy to destabilize the region, to put a halt on the Saudi-Israel peace deal. So did they succeed? When the attack happened, all eyes were on Saudi Arabia. How would the Saudis react? What would they say? And Riyadh did come out with a statement. The starting of the statement sounded like any other. It noted the unprecedented situation. It called for restraint on both sides. And then there was the part about Palestine, the need to resolve the conflict, the need for a credible peace process. So restraint and need for peace, that was the crux. No clear support for one side, and that is telling. Then came the statement from the United Arab Emirates. They took it a step further. The UAE called it a serious and grave escalation and they slammed the hostage taking of Israeli civilians. They slammed Hamas. So no support from the Saudis and condemnation from the UAE. That's what Hamas got. What about the other players in the region? Turkey, Egypt and Qatar. We put them together because all three are vying for the same role. They all want to be peacemakers. Erdogan says Ankara is ready to do what it takes to lower tensions in the region. Listen to this. Turkey is ready to do what it can for the clashes to end as soon as possible and lower the tensions that have further increased with the latest incidents. We are determined to intensify and continue the diplomatic efforts we have launched for the calm to be established again. Which brings us to Egypt. It shares a border with Israel and Gaza. The country faces elections in two months, so it cannot afford mayhem in the region. It played the role of a peacemaker in the 2021 war, and it's likely to try again. In fact, other groups are already sending signals through Cairo. Hezbollah, for one, has sent a message to Israel through Egypt. Now, the Hezbollah are a Lebanese militant group, and they've warned against a full-blown assault in Gaza. So Egypt is already playing the role of messenger and it could soon play the role of peacemaker as well. Then we come to Qatar, a country that seems to be doing a lot of mediation and they do have an upper hand. Hamas's power base may be in Gaza, but their headquarters are in Qatar. A lot of their top leaders live in Qatar, including Hamas chief Ismail Haniya. He lives in Doha. He's said to be leading the life of luxury in this Gulf nation. So Qatar becomes a crucial negotiator here and they are already talking. Qatar is in touch with Hamas to negotiate the release of Israeli hostages. What they're proposing is a swap. Doha is proposing a swap. Free the Israeli women and children. And in return, Israel will free Palestinian women and children in their prisons. Almost like a prisoner swap. Now Qatar says the negotiations are positive. But there's been no breakthrough yet. Israel too has not condemned this. So Egypt and Qatar are both negotiating for peace. Turkey says it will do what it can. Saudi and UAE are condemning but not supporting. This is a region that once fought wars for the Palestinian cause. Now they're limiting themselves to statements about restraint and peace. But can they continue this for long? How will they react if Israel invades Gaza? It's a test of their diplomacy and the peace deals they signed. Hamas's terror attack on Israel on Saturday shocked the world. India was among the first countries to condemn it. Prime Minister Modi issued a statement. He said, and I quote, Deeply shocked by the news of terrorist attacks in Israel. Our thoughts and prayers are with the innocent victims and their families. We stand in solidarity with Israel at this difficult hour. Israel has thanked India for this support. We are heart, you know, uh, heartfelt from the huge support we got from India, from the Prime Minister, through a few ministers who called me, businessmen, civil servants, just people from the street. Our, our uh, uh, social media is, is full of people who are showing their support and we appreciate it. We appreciate it very strongly, I'll tell you why. Because India, first of all, is a very important country in the world, but secondly, India comes from a position of a country who knows terrorism. Hashtag India stands with Israel is trending. What do you think explains the strong support from India? India and Israel are more than 4,000 kilometers apart, but they're united in their experience. They share a long and painful history of fighting terrorism. Indians are all too familiar with the pain that the ordinary Israeli is feeling today. Our right to peaceful existence has been threatened time and again by the depraved actions of our neighbor. So India understands Israel's pain and plight. 
But beyond the unmitigated humanitarian tragedy is the geopolitics. What's at stake for India in this conflict? To answer that, we must understand history. In 1950, India announced its recognition of Israel. It was one of the last non-Muslim states to recognize Israel. India was one of the last non-Muslim states. But India was also among the first to recognize Palestine. That happened in 1988. And that's not all. In 1974, India became the first non-Arab state to recognize the Palestine Liberation Organization. New Delhi accepted this group as the sole representative of the Palestinian people. So historically, India's ties with Palestine have run deeper compared to those with Israel. In the 1980s, Yasser Arafat visited India frequently. He was a Palestinian leader, Yasser Arafat. But beyond the optics, there was also disquiet in India over India's unabashed support of Palestine. Imperceptibly, the ground beneath was shifting and Pakistan played a role in it. I'll explain how. While India supported the Palestinian cause, the Arab nations did not return the favor. They did not show such support for India. For instance, in 1962, India and China fought a war. And what was the stand of the Arab nations in that conflict, the 1962 war? They were neutral. And it got worse. Both in 1965 and 1971, India was facing Pakistan on the battlefield. And guess who the Arab nations backed then? They backed Pakistan. Geopolitics doesn't quite work as a one-sided love story. And India learned that lesson over time. Do you know what Israel did in the meantime? It helped India. With arms and ammunition, both in 1962 and in 1965, Israel helped India. But the relationship remained like a secret affair. The major shift came in the 1990s. That's when Iraq invaded Kuwait. Among Saddam Hussein's few allies was Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian leader. And that dangerous gambit alienated Arafat. In 1991, in fact, the Soviet Union disintegrated. West Asia was undergoing a transformation. Allies and allegiances were changing. And India did not want to be shoehorned into a corner. So in 1992, New Delhi established full diplomatic relations with Israel. And over the years, the ties have become stronger. In fact, we told you about this on Saturday. Let's reiterate some of the numbers. Today, India is Israel's seventh largest trade partner and Israel is India's third largest defense partner. Defense, diamonds and drip irrigation dominate the bilateral ties. And this has come in handy for India, especially during the Kargil War. That was in 1999. India issued an SOS, it needed help and Israel responded. It supplied India with target bombs and this proved to be crucial in India's victory. Then in 2014, the Narendra Modi government came to power. Ties with Israel came into focus. In 2017, Prime Minister Modi visited Israel, the first Indian Prime Minister to do so. And he did not go to Palestine then. And this was a major shift on India's part. Modi de-hyphenated Israel and Palestine. His personal equation with the Israeli leader has been much talked about. From the beach walk to the kite flying to spinning Gandhi's charkha, they've done it all. One year later, in 2018, Prime Minister Modi did make a trip to Palestine and this time around, he did not visit Israel. So the message from India was clear. India had not abandoned the relationship with Palestine. It had merely recalibrated it. Now, admittedly, this diplomatic maneuvering is a difficult balancing act. But sometimes, events demand that nations take a clear stand. Saturday's terror attack by Hamas was one such occasion. Hamas's manipulation of religion as political tribalism has few takers and India certainly is not one of them. By calling it what it is, a terror attack, the Modi government has made it stand clear. Now let's tell you about the worst site of Israeli casualties, a music festival. It was called the Supernova Festival. It was being held in southern Israel. Thousands of young men and women had gathered for it. They were dancing and camping out in tents. Suddenly, a handful of police officers rushed in. They broke up the party, screaming, Code Red. Now, Code Red usually means danger, but in Israel, Code Red means that there is incoming rocket fire. So, party goers scrambled towards their cars. Suddenly, another kind of fire began. Hamas terrorists stormed the festival and opened fire. And just like that, this music festival turned into a massacre. It became one of the first sites targeted by Hamas, also perhaps the deadliest. 
At least 260 bodies have been recovered so far. Some attendees have been taken hostage. Here's a report. Imale. This is a common Israeli expression of fear. But even so, it's not something you would hear at a music festival. Except that's what many people were heard screaming at the Supernova Festival held in southern Israel. The outdoor festival was supposed to be an all-night dance party. Thousands of people had gathered to celebrate the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. But as dawn broke, the music festival turned into a massacre. People began hearing sirens and rockets. A handful of police officers soon arrived, screaming code red. That's code in Israel for incoming rocket fire. Soon, partygoers scrambled towards their cars. Some laid on the ground, hoping for the barrage to pass. That's when another kind of fire began. Suddenly, pickup trucks arrived at the spot, filled with Hamas terrorists. They stormed the festival and opened fire. Eyewitnesses say they were shooting at people just a meter away, carrying out executions. More than 260 people have been reported dead. The festival was one of the first sites targeted by the Hamas's shock ground attack. It's also perhaps the deadliest. But the deaths it resulted in aren't the only consequence. Many civilians were taken hostage by Hamas. 25-year-old Noah Argamani was one of them. She is an Israeli woman. She was attending the festival with her boyfriend. This harrowing video shows them being kidnapped by the terrorists. Argamani is driven away on a motorcycle. As the video pans, her boyfriend is seen with an arm pinned behind his back. Both have been captured and this video has gone viral. The couple's family and friends are pleading for their safe return. What can I say? My whole life since she was born, I have done my best to protect and to hug her and to support and love her. And now in this difficult moment, to at least encourage her. I couldn't say anything to tell her something. Noah, cheer up. I saw her boyfriend crying. What difficult days. Difficult days. It's been nerve-wracking to just feel hopeless. You can't do anything. It's the most helplessness I ever felt. Um, Argamani and her boyfriend aren't the only ones being held hostage. Reports say a British man named Jake Marlowe may have been captured. He was working as a security guard at the festival. Same worries around Shani Luke, a German tourist. This attack wasn't just premeditated, it was also highly coordinated. As the shooting began, the sky was also suddenly dotted with militants on hang gliders. They emptied rounds of ammunition on attendees. This included hand grenades and mortar fire. While many are dead, Israel hopes for the safety of those who've been held hostage. Now we don't know how this war will end, whether it will escalate even more or maybe spill over into other countries. But we can be sure of one thing. There are lessons here, lessons for West Asia and lessons for the world. For starters, peace deals do not guarantee peace. Certainly not the Arab-Israeli ones, or what we call the Abraham Accords. You see, those were political deals. They were not about resolving the Palestinian question or forgetting the Arab-Israeli animosity. Those deals were about convenience. The likes of the UAE and Bahrain wanted to cash in on Israel's technology and economy. Likewise, Israel wanted recognition. It was never going to work, it seems. The dispute between Israel and Arabs was never about money or technology. The dispute was about Palestine, yet the peace deals never dealt with it. And the result was this. Divisions festered underneath. But does that justify Saturday's attack? Of course not. Nothing can justify that sort of violence. Nothing. But it does explain the attack. And this applies to many conflicts around the world. Take Ukraine, for example. In 2014, fighting broke out in eastern Ukraine. Kiev regime was on one side, Russian separatists were on the other side. As the fighting raged on, talks were held. All stakeholders eventually signed what they called the Minsk Agreement. It talked about finding a permanent solution. 
but the agreement itself was not permanent and now look at that conflict it has escalated into a full scale war another example is the korean conflict both the koreas fought a war from 1950 to 1953 they signed a ceasefire but not a peace deal and now look at them neighbors but also sworn enemies Serbia and Kosovo same story Armenia and Azerbaijan again the same close at home you have India and Pakistan these are all unfinished conflicts they ended with deals or agreements that ignored the root problem whether it's land or race or religion and that's not what a peace deal means a peace deal solves the problem it doesn't ignore it so in the end you have a very unstable situation a peace deal or something similar on paper but a volatile equation underneath do you know what makes it worse big power politics consider the war here where did hamas get thousands of rockets from chances are iran and who gave them political support again iran in the korean peninsula you have china in eastern ukraine you had russia these are all powerful countries they can invest millions of dollars into conflict zones or send weapons and artillery but who suffers in the end it's the people who live here my point is incomplete peace deals do not work they only delay the inevitable so what's the solution a comprehensive peace process not a sign and forget deal but a process and in such a process you address the root problems like old hostilities maybe through reparations or formal apologies you address sectarian politics you bring community leaders and politicians on the same page you build trust and finally you control the flow of weapons and capital because let's face it militants and terrorists thrive because they get support foreign support whether it's the Hamas in Gaza or the Mujahideen in Afghanistan or the Contras in Nicaragua even countries for that matter how did the likes of Pakistan and North Korea get nuclear weapons with foreign help and such weapons complicate matters even more so we need to eliminate outside factors like weapons and big power politics we need Palestinians to speak for themselves not via proxies or terrorists and when they do the other side needs to listen that's crucial too If not groups like Hamas will hijack the narrative with their terror attacks they will torpedo all hopes of peace I guess what I'm trying to say is this peace cannot be innovated or imposed it has to be painstakingly built with goodwill with cooperation and the hopes of the people in mind Palestine and Israel never got that they were pawns in a larger game and now those same larger powers are taking sides urging more violence and bloodshed It's not the people who suffer though it's the Israelis and Palestinians And that's all we have for you on today's Vantage Israel edition like I said before this is a story that is developing every minute and we will continue to bring you all updates from the heart of the action we apologize for the bad audio with the military helicopters flying uh, in this region uh, but do stay tuned to first post and before we leave you a look at the war in pictures Today we'll be focusing 